But if you put your trust and hope in God, the prophet's words will comfort you. A a time is coming when the spirit will be poured out and breathe life into lifelessness. We are continuing our series in the prophets Today we're looking at the book of Ezekiel, and Ezekiel is an interesting character because he was actually in line to be a priest, not a prophet, but a priest, and he was deported with the exiles from Jerusalem, 1,500 miles away. You can see that red line from Jerusalem all the way to Babylon, and you'll see, I don't know if you can see it, there's something there that says the Chabar Canal outside of Babylon, that's actually where God showed up to Ezekiel and called him to be a prophet while he was 1,500 miles away from Jerusalem with all the other exiles. And now his prophecy, his book is actually pretty dark until it gets to chapter 33. Chapter 33 gets really dark because he gets message from someone that Jerusalem, the holy city of God, Zion, has fallen to Babylon. The city is now in captivity itself. And it's interesting because after that really bad news, the book of Ezekiel changes tones a little bit from darkness and despair to hope. It changes to hope. And that's because one of the prophet's jobs is to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. In other words, if you have a false hope that's not in God, the prophet will bother you. The prophet will bother you. But if you put your trust and hope in God, the prophet's words will comfort you. And last week we had a really hard word from the prophet Jeremiah, but today's word is a word of comfort from Ezekiel. And it's not really a call, it's a vision that he receives. Ezekiel receives a vision in chapter 37 Now, a vision, it's it's not a dream. It's more like a movie that you find yourself in and that's not really real. In other words, it's not really happening in the physical world, but God's putting this picture out there like a movie, but you're in it. And that's what happens to Ezekiel. He finds himself in this vision where he is in a valley of dry bones. A valley of dry bones. And as we read this, remember that the key word in this is hope. So let's read Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. This is God's word. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by his spirit and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were a great many of them on the surface of the valley, and they were Not just dry, but very dry. Then he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? I replied, Lord God, only you know. He said to me, prophesy concerning these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God says to these bones. I will cause breath to enter you and you will live. I will put tendons on you make flesh grow on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you so that you come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded. And while I was prophesying, prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound. And the bones came together, bone to bone. As I looked, the tendons appeared on them, flesh grew, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. He said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man. Say to it, this is what the Lord God says, breathe, come from the four winds and breathe into these slain so that they may live. So I I prophesied as he commanded me. The breath entered them and they came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. 
Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Look how they say, our bones are dried up and our hope, our hope has perished. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the Lord God says, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them, my people, and and lead you into the land of Israel. You will know that I am the Lord, my people, when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it. This is the declaration of the Lord. The word of God. God, be with the preaching of your word. Change us and transform us and give us new hope. Amen. Last Saturday, I was watching TV and I saw something pretty hopeless. I was watching on Saturday afternoon uh, the Euro Cup, which is the, basically the World Cup of Europe and all the European teams are playing together for over a month to win the European Cup. And I happened to be watching the game of Finland versus Denmark. And uh, it was in Copenhagen in Denmark. They were hosting the match. And, of course, the, 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 is it Danish people? Is that what Denmark, people from Denmark are? The Danes, yeah. The Danes were, were going crazy because they were hosting this match. And they were just excited. Like, after a year of COVID, here we are. This is our home match, we're hosting our rivals, the people from Finland, and we're going to win this game. And it was just really exciting. And then I saw something tragic happen. Uh, One of the best players on Denmark was a man named Christian Eriksson. And and there on live TV, he began to walk towards the sideline, and his teammate was going to throw in the ball to him. But as the ball was being thrown, Eriksson just crumpled forward and everybody knew something was wrong because he hadn't tripped no one had pushed him he just went down hard and as he was going down as he was falling down the ball just hit him in the chest like he was totally unaware and there in the middle of the stadium on live tv christian erickson just lay on the ground lifeless I was like, what, what is going on? I ran and got my wife, and I, something just happened to this, this guy on, on the TV. Well, no one was expecting it, and, and so it took people a couple of minutes to realize that something serious had happened, and the, the players gathered around him and began, someone, come, come help. And the, the mood in the stadium just changed because everyone had seen it. Everyone around the world watching the game had seen it. And the players began to realize that something tragic was happening. And so just for a little bit of privacy during that moment, you can see in the picture there that they gathered in a circle around their teammate to sort of just give him some space for whatever was going on. And the the hosts on TV didn't really know what to do. You, You can't really go to a commercial break during that time because everyone on TV is like, what's going on? And they began to pan the faces in the crowd, and you could just see the crowd had all seen what was happening, and it just felt kind of hopeless. And then they panned to Erickson's girlfriend, and she was just crumpled, tears in her eyes, hopeless, as she looked across the field at her lifeless boyfriend. Some of the players went over and began to comfort her. And then the, the, the medics came on. They came running over to where Erickson was. There he lay, lifeless. And it was a challenging thing to watch. In just a moment, things have gone from exciting and full of life, to lifeless and without hope. What had happened was Erickson, in the middle of the match, had had a heart problem, and his heart stopped beating, and he literally fell over and crumpled. And it was just so tragic to watch. And since we couldn't really see what was happening, we couldn't see his face, we didn't know what was going on, all we could do was look at the hopeless faces of his teammates guiding or or blocking the view. But just because it was lifeless and hopeless didn't mean that there wasn't hope coming. See, the medic ran on the field and he had the paddles. 
And right there on live TV, CPR and the defibrillator and brought Christian Erickson back to life. Brought Christian Erickson back to life. He, the, the medic went on to the field with the power of life in his hands and was able to revive this man from the dead, was able to take a lifeless situation and create hope because he had the power of life in his hands. Now, we didn't find out much later until what actually happened because his teammates shielded him as the doctors wheeled him off, uh, off the stadium. But, but now Christian Erickson is alive, and he is being supported by the world in the midst of this hard thing that he went through, um, I don't know if he'll ever make a return to soccer, but the world is behind him as he recovers, and he's alive. Life can feel hopeless at times. Uh, reality can make it feel like life is really death. Now, that's for certain true as we think about the reality of death in this world. We have all lost people, and it's a tragedy, and it's really hard. But I find that sometimes life circumstances just beat us down and make us feel like there is no hope. We go through situation after situation, and it's hard to feel like we can keep getting back up out of bed every day. Not only that, but our own spiritual state, the state of our own hearts at times can leave us without hope. I mean, we struggle with sin after sin. We want to remain connected to God. We want to follow him, and yet there's something in our hearts that just feels alive, but not really alive to God. We feel tired and exhausted, and we want to follow him, but there's sometimes when we just don't care. But here's the thing about the God who carries the power of life in his hands. Lifelessness does not intimidate him. Hopelessness does not stop him. With our God, nothing is beyond redemption. Nothing is beyond fixing. Nothing is truly finished. Nothing is hopeless because we serve a God who brings hope to the hopeless and breathes life to the dead. In our passage for today, Ezekiel is whisked away to this valley. And I want you to picture a valley that has like rocky crags on the side, maybe tumbleweeds blowing across it, no vegetation, it's just cracked, dried mud. And as you look at it, you think, I do not want to go through there. It looks lifeless and hopeless. But as Ezekiel looks at it in the vision, he sees that it's not empty but in fact, there's skeleton after skeleton, bone after bone. Human skeletons. And they're not fresh. They haven't been put there recently. They're dry and dusty and bleached by the sun. This isn't the valley of the shadow of death. This is the valley of death. And God asks Ezekiel, Ezekiel, verse 3, can these bones live? How do you answer a question like that? I mean, dead things don't come back to life, but God is God. So do I say no or yes? And Ezekiel in verse 3, he wisely says, Oh God, only you know. Only you know. But in verse 4, God tells Ezekiel, Prophesy concerning these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Dry bones hear the word of the Lord. Now, when he says prophesy, what that really means in the Hebrew is preach. Preach the word of God to these dead, dry, bleached, dusty bones. You know, sometimes when you and I have problems, we're afraid to admit how big our problems really are. We're afraid to admit that we feel much more like dry, dusty bones and there's no hope, and there's no life. And in the midst of those situations, we need something a little more powerful than just daily affirmations. Daily affirmations are good. Self-help is good. Motivational speech is good. But notice what God tells Ezekiel to do. Don't just speak positively. Speak the word of God to lifeless 
bones. And in verse 5 and 6, that, that's what happens. This is what the Lord of God says to these bones. I will cause breath to enter you and you will live. I will put tendons on you and make flesh grow on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you so that you come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So then Isaiah preaches to the dry bones exactly what God had said. And while he's preaching, a rattling sound comes. The bones begin to not just be scattered bones, but come together to form skeletons. And then tendons form on them. And then skin comes on them to form bodies. I told this to my daughter, and one of them goes, that is disgusting. But it's not meant to disgust us. It's meant to give us hope. Hope that God's word brings hope into hopelessness. God's word brings hope into hopelessness. Notice how God is not afraid to show Ezekiel something that's really bad. This is bad. There's no, there's no greater scale of death than you can get a, a, as a valley of bones that are not just dry, but very dry. There's no hope that those bones can produce life for themselves. See, I think oftentimes as Christians, we are afraid to admit some of the things in our life. Now, whether it's the sin, the the death of sin, or, or whether it's just that circumstances are really hard and we are hopeless, we try and keep it positive. You know, we go to church and Manny asks me, how you doing? I say, good, brother. God is good. Meanwhile, I've got issues in my life, right? I've got things in my life that look like dry, dusty bones. But notice how how God isn't afraid to say it's dead. Because God's word brings hope into the midst of hopelessness. Maybe you need to get a little more real about the marriage problems that you're having. Maybe you need to stop saying that that area of addiction in your life is just fine. Uh, Maybe... You need to say, uh, my pride actually isn't under control. Maybe you need to admit that that bitterness you're going through is not just a season, but an attitude of your heart over a long period of time. Maybe you need to admit that you're lifeless and you're dead and you're without hope. Because what happens with Ezekiel is as he sees that dead, lifeless place without hope, he believes the word of God and he obeys it. He believes the word of God and he obeys it and he speaks exactly what God tells him to speak into the situation and hope gets flushed out into hopelessness. Friends, when you and I are hopeless, we don't just need a little tweak. We need the word of God. We need the word of God. We need the promises of God when we're without hope We need the commands of God when we don't know which way to go. We need the story of God that's all about Jesus when we don't have a direction for our lives. The reason why the word of God is so powerful at bringing hope is because the word of God itself is alive. In Hebrews 4, chapter 12, it says, For the word of God is living, living, and effective, and sharper than any double-edged sword penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now, sometimes when we engage the word of God, it's actually quite painful. It doesn't feel like life. But that's because the word of God is cutting out the cancer of your unbelief. It's cutting out the disease of your disobedience in your life. And it's actually bringing life. It's bringing life and hope to you. That's why the word of God is so important to us as Christians, to us as a church. Dads, how are you doing at leading your kids in the word of God? Not just knowing it, but but using the word of God to bring hope and faith into your home. To teach your kids how to find hope in the word of God when their lives are hopeless. The word of God brings life, brings hope into the hopelessness. Ezekiel has this vast army. Now, 
bones have come together with tendons and muscles and skin, but there's no breath in them. There's no breath in them. They're not breathing. They're not alive. They're gathered. They're standing, but they're not, they're not alive. But in verse 9 through 10, God says to him, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, say to it, this is what the Lord God says. Breath, come from the four winds and breathe into these slain so that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath entered them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. Now that word for breath is used over and over in this passage, and it's the Hebrew word ruach. And it doesn't just mean breath or wind, it means spirit the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity comes to this vast group of slain and breathes life into them because God's Spirit breathes life into lifelessness. God's Spirit breathes life into lifelessness. In fact, you know, much of what the prophets are getting at in general is that a time is coming when the Spirit will be poured out and breathe life into lifelessness. The people are lifeless because they've been disobedient to God. They've broken the covenant with God. They've rebelled against him. They've worshiped idols. They've become more like the culture that surrounds them rather than showing God to the culture. They're lifeless. How in the world, if they haven't got it right, if they stink like death, how in the world are they going to become beacons of life and light for God? The Holy Spirit. Look at this a chapter before, Ezekiel 36, the chapter before. He says, I will also sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit, my breath, my ruach within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully obey my ordinances. This is talk about a new covenant, one that Israel couldn't break with God but one that God would keep on their behalf. And what was characteristic of this covenant was that he would put himself in their hearts, that God himself would come to live by his Holy Spirit in them, bringing life to their deadness. Now, this isn't something as Christians that we are waiting for. This is something that has already happened for us when Jesus came. Hang with me for a second. Sometimes you and I look at the circumstances in life and we lose hope. We lose hope because we forget what God has already done for us. You and I look at the future and we go, there's no hope, there's no future, there's no life for me. But we forget what Christ has already accomplished on our behalf. We forget that God has already poured his spirit out on sinners like us. That, though there is a rebellious part of us, God has already given us a new heart. This isn't something that's going to happen. This was a prophecy that was fulfilled when Jesus came and the Holy Spirit was poured out in Acts 2. And now you and I have a new spirit living within us who every day breathes life into these dry, dusty bones, into my dead soul that has nothing to offer God on its own. The spirit comes and breathes life into me, not because of anything good that I've done, but because God is good. So don't forget the spiritual miracle that God has already done in you when you became a Christian. On your own, your heart does not work properly. You need something from the outside, just like Christian Erickson needed a defibrillator. But that thing from the outside is not paddles, it is the Spirit. It is the Spirit of God. But without the Spirit of God, we have no hope. In verse 11, Ezekiel Ezekiel was told, then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. In other words, 
look at the bones. This is the spiritual state of my people. Look how they say our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are cut off. In other words, politically, they have no power. Spiritually, they're in the midst of discipline because of what they've done against God. Uh, In terms of a nation, they are two nations that have split into two. They have no hope and their bones are dried up. But God, in the midst of that darkness, promises the Spirit. Promises the Spirit. Look at how Jesus said it in John chapter 3. Whatever is born of flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. One more slide. The wind blows where it pleases, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Again, this is Jesus reminding us that even though life might be challenging, life might feel hopeless, life might feel lifeless, you have the Holy Spirit of God living in you, who has brought about spiritual life by God's grace, because God's ultimate goal is to restore his people to life and hope. God wants you to be full of life. God wants you to be full of hope, even when you're in a valley of dry bones. Look what he says in verse 13 and 14. You will know, you will know that I am the Lord, my people, when I open up your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live I will settle you in your own land, then you will know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it. This is the declaration of the Lord. In the midst of that hopelessness, God is promising that he will restore his people to the promised land, that he will eventually bring a king who would rule over them as a shepherd. We know that that king is Jesus. But for us, listen, friends, life might feel hopeless. Life might feel lifeless. But what does it say? Through Jesus Christ, you and I have the hope of knowing God as Father. You and I know Jesus Christ, who, though we were dead in our sins, he became death, so that through his resurrection, we could find life and hope. See, we're always trying to get to life and hope, but Jesus went from life to death for us. Jesus went into hopelessness, being on the cross, separated from his father, so that when you and I repent and believe and trust in him, we are restored and reconciled to relationship with God, so that no matter what you're going through in life, you have the hope of knowing God as father. And this table is a simple reminder of that for you today. This table was given not just as a ceremony, but to put hope in you. To put hope in you. Christians call this the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist or communion. Worship team, you can go ahead and come on up. Jesus gave this ordinance to his disciples the night that he was betrayed. The night it was about to be hopeless, he gave them this hope. As they were gathered, he took the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you, take and eat. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup, do you know what he says? Of the new covenant. The new covenant is the spirit coming to live in us through Jesus' work that you and I might have hope Every day, this is the cup of the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, Friends, as you eat the bread and as you drink the juice today, might you be reminded that you are alive because Jesus died. That you have hope because Jesus went into hopelessness. But he didn't stay there. He defeated death, and on the third day, he rose again. Amen?